Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternities, uh, a perfect episode number 10, Home the Expanse. This video is a part of a series of videos where I um, examine an episode from one of my favorite shows, which I find to be near perfect. This video is the 10th video and final video in that series of 10 videos that were given in no particular order or basically just the order I felt like going in. Um, and so in this uh, video I will examine um, one of my favorites, if not my favorite episode of um, all time and that is uh, episode 5 of season 2 of The Expanse an episode called Home. Would be fitting for me to end uh, my series of a perfect episode on an episode I felt was the closest to perfect <laughs> that could be. And that was uh, almost nearly perfect. Um, one that is an experience that will stay with me for a long time. It's an episode that um, that really um, worked for me better than most movies or any other episodes of television. Um, so, The Expanse is one of my favorite shows, if not my favorite show of all time. Uh, was uh, super impressed with it. Mainly it started with this episode because before I saw this episode, The Expanse was a good sci-fi show that I enjoyed watching. After I watched this episode, The Expanse was one of the greatest shows ever made. <laughs> and it continued this high quality uh, for the rest of its run, although I will say there was not a singular episode that was quite as great as this one, but I don't really hold that against the show because that is a, an extremely high bar, uh, as I think this is one of the greatest, if not the greatest episode ever made. So, um, at the start of my... Um, Introduction to my A Perfect uh, episode series. I did say I was going to leave out Star Trek because I talked about Star Trek too much on my channel already. And I didn't feel the need to include in this series, which is mainly for underrated episodes that are often overlooked or I did not have the chance to explore previously. And I also, for the same reason, said I would not be including any Game of Thrones since I've also covered that show very extensively on my channel. But I never said I was not going to include The Expanse. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I did have covered The Expanse pretty extensively on my channel as well, but not as much. And um, I have done a detailed video for this episode. However, that was for my book to show comparison series where I did go scene by scene but I and broke each scene down but I did that in the attempts of uh, comparing it to the books seeing the changes and what I thought of it and whatnot and this episode of course I gave it an extremely high score and thought that it really surpassed the novels which is you know, apparently people did not like my opinion of season three of the expansion, which is it failed to live up to the novel and uh, say that I'm just a book purist, a book nerd, and don't give the show a chance, which is actually untrue when you look at my examination of this episode, which I think is far superior uh, to the source material. It's a huge elevation and a huge accomplishment. Now, one story I would like to tell, because I recently watched the podcast Ty and That Guy, that uh, author, of, uh, one of the co-authors of the novels and executive producer of the show, Ty Frank, does a podcast with uh, the actor who portrays Amos uh, West Chatham. And on that podcast, when they were discussing this episode in particular, um, Ty Frank relayed the story of when they first pitched the expanse as a tv show to uh the networks and he said that when they were pitching it to sci-fi uh the original show runner creator mark otsby was put making this pitch 
and he um, pitched the show by pitching this episode specifically. Like, this was what he used. This was, like, the building point that they were working towards. So this is how he pitched the entire show, was by pitching this specific episode. And uh, Ty Frank recounts that one of the um, network execs in that meeting was brought to tears just by him explaining this episode <laughs> um and and that is that is the power uh, of this episode and it doesn't surprise me that they would choose this episode in particular to to pitch this entire show and i will say i've seen this episode at least 15 times like around 10 15 perhaps even more really and there hasn't been a single solitary time that i watched this episode that i was not drenched in tears once uh, <laughs> um and and this this latest time i watched this episode you know just a day ago for in preparation of this video and that viewing was no exception uh, <laughs> so it does to me this is an extremely if not the most effective episode ever made so let's go ahead and um jump into the episode so the episode begins right where the previous episode left off, so I do have to explain some backstory here. So there was an asteroid called Eros that was uh, had a small colony on it that was settled. However, um, the, the scientists used it as an experiment and they spread this uh, substance, alien substance, known as the protomolecule, uh, and which took over the entire station and asteroid and killed its inhabitants. And for several months it was abandoned until uh, Miller and Fred Johnson had decided that it was uh, still going to be an issue because there was weird things going on with the protomolecule uh, and doing who knows what to the asteroid. So they decided to go on the mission to destroy the asteroid by ramming a giant... Uh, a colony ship called the Nauvoo into um, Eros in order to destroy it and Miller was sent uh, to the surface of Eros to plant some nuclear bombs to aid in its destruction however there was an accident and one of the bombs broke where he had to hold down the button of the bomb uh, or otherwise it would go off in 60 seconds so we'd have to press the button uh, every um, 60 seconds to prevent it from exploding so it became so much, uh, somewhat of a dead man switch. So uh, he elected to stay behind on Eros to hold the bomb so it wouldn't go off prematurely and thus sacrifice him himself as the Navu ran into Eros. However, when the Navu was about to uh, collide with the asteroid, the asteroid inex inexplicably moved out of the way, which is something that should be impossible. Uh, so the episode begins with Miller on Eros, and um, after he's been, just been told by Holden and the crew of the Rosnate that the Eros had moved to dodge the collision of the Nauvoo, um, and he's noting that um, it appears he can see the Rosnate getting smaller, so it appears that Eros is moving very fast away from them. However, he's not experiencing any uh, any um, acceleration, which is uh, typical of uh, this show, which tries to stay uh, true to um, what we know of real life physics. Um, so the the protomolecule seems to be breaking all of the laws of physics, which Holden even states. So oh, I guess we broke a few laws of physics here. And um, Alex makes a note about how uh, this could be uh, magic. Now. Having something as magic or um, kind of like fantastical science fiction, which a lot of common science fiction shows and movies do, most notably Star Trek with Warp Drive and stuff like that, is something that the Expanse avoids and tries to, to have uh, most of their howl 
their space travel works rooted in uh, actual science. However, in this case, this is, isn't. <laughs> it is a bit fantastical. However, Naomi uh, finds that there is an exhaust, like a heat source coming from the asteroid so there is an exhaust there is some and she talks through it like scientifically saying that there is uh some some measure of saying you know stuff that they can identify with science that is taking place so what this makes me think of is the arthur c clark quote that uh advanced technology or even modern day technology if we travel back in time uh, to the um, prehistoric human beings they it would appear like magic to them so it's like advanced technology appears like magic to those less advanced and so that's what i think the show is getting off here and so is explaining that this isn't magic that naomi can see that there is some use here some reasoning of how this is working however this protomolecule technology is so far advanced like millions of years and more advanced to where they're at that that they cannot fully understand it and so to some people it appears like magic but really it is just super advanced technology um, which is something the books get a little bit more into um, because uh, Naomi and, and Amos are like completely in shock and unable to move because they what they see what appears to be magic to them, uh, but then they fig talk through it and figure it out scientifically, and then they're okay with it. Which is we do get a, a shortened, like a summarized version of that here, which is I think honestly all you need. Uh, for the show uh, I think it does sort of explain but it, and also we get a scene a brief scene on earth with Avasarela in her war room where their lead the UN lead scientist is also making it clear that the, he has absolutely no explanation as to why an asteroid can turn into a spaceship um, and start accelerating on its own so basically establishing just how advanced this protomolecule is, which is very important for the story going forward. So then we go to the war room on Earth, and we see um, Alice Rala and um, Secretary General Gillis and his second in charge, um, Aaron Wright, uh, as, long, as well as a bunch of generals and scientists, all debating on what is happening with errors. We have um, Admiral Wynn, who is more militaristic, he is suggesting that this is a weapon built by Mars, but Alva Sorella is not quite buying it, which is smart because <laughs> this is far beyond what Mars is capable of building. However, they then get an update on the course of Eris and find that it is, in fact, on a direct uh, collision course for earth and it's accelerating even faster so um yeah <laughs> they all of course shit their pants and freaked out and then um some logistics officers goes over exactly how much how many people would die how much damage it would cause and it was essentially mean um pretty much the extinction of the human race as most of Earth's natural resources would be wiped out in the collision. Of course, they're not even talking about how the protomolecule itself would hijack all life and take over all life on Earth. So it's basically what they're talking about is the extinction of the human race. And they made clear later on that it, um, all the other human colonies in the belt and Mars and other places would also eventually starve without the food and resources of Earth to sustain them. So, um, yes, <laughs> not a very pleasant prospect. Now, we also get a scene of Aaron Wright, who was actually in league with Jules Pierre Mao, who was leading the science experiment on the protomolecule. And uh, Mao has since gone silent and refused to talk to Aaron Wright once he find that Avasarala kind of found out about them. However, 
We see Aaron Wright leave uh, Jules Paramount a very angry message saying that perhaps he might want to rein in his goddamn science experiment. Um, showing just how desperate and he is and how afraid he is um, because, you know, the whole human race is at uh, risk. So then we go back to the war room, though, and we see that... Um, Aaron Wright has come up with a plan to launch missiles and destroy errors. Uh, the lead scientist, uh, Janice, uh, su suggests that they don't know what will happen if they um, destroy errors, if the protomolecule will be uh, spread throughout the system. But Aaron Wright just suggests doing a second strike to clean up any residual. And uh, Sumerto Gillis agrees to this. Um, so yeah, I actually love, this is also another change from the book, because Avasarala and these characters weren't even introduced until later books, so during these scenes we did not get the perspective at all from anyone on Earth, the only viewpoint characters were Holden and Miller, who were both out at the situation at the time, although in the books there was a UN vessel that was present there that wasn't here in the show, so you could say that's kind of Earth's perspective, but I think it's actually much more interesting to, to see the perspective of people who are actually on Earth, and nonetheless the leadership and how scared and freaked out they are, um, I think it was actually quite powerful. Back on the Resonate, we see that um, Amos is sort of discovering the center of Eros, or where where the um, center of the drive that is uh, propelling Eros. Uh, Naomi refers to this as the seed crystal. And then she comes up with a what she calls a very bad idea, where she feels like Miller could take his nuke that he has with him and go uh, to the center of errors, to the seed crystal, and uh, destroy it. And that could possibly stop errors and destroy it and prevent it from uh, going to Earth. Uh, everyone else, like Holden and Alex, seem a bit unsure about this idea. However, Miller pipes in that he thinks it's the best bad idea he's heard all day and that he's going to take his pet nuke for a little walk. Um, Naomi then assures him that uh, she's going to figure out a way around the dead man switch so that they can set it on a timer so that they can go in and retrieve Miller um, and pick him up once he's set the uh, new to a uh, timer. And Miller, uh, you know, says something like how he appreciates that and whatnot. Now, I kind of get the impression that Miller is just placating Naomi, that he's kind of this, you know, okay, and decided that he is going to die <laughs> with when he sets off the need. And he, we seen in the previous episode that he had already you know, decided that he would sacrifice him, his life to destroy Eros. So I think he's still along those lines, but he doesn't really want to argue the point with Naomi, and so he's just placating her so she can still think that there's hope he, he'll he survive, but I think he knows better. Um, so yeah, so that was all pretty interesting. So on the Rosnate, Holden asks Naomi for a uh, more details on the plan she has, and Naomi says that basically she's going to find a way to rig the nuke uh, so it will uh, go on a timer, and then uh, Miller's going to find his way back to the surface, and they can swoop in and save him. Uh, Alex is really upset by the suggestion and says that, that you realize that us swooping in is going to be really, really tricky, uh, for them to land on a moving target and that they will most likely end up uh, dead <laughs> trying to do so and uh, Naomi Yale shouts back at him that um, Miller is risking his ass down there and so it's about time that they should all do the same and this seems to placate uh, Holden and Amos who uh, tend to agree with her and so they go forward with this plan now, uh, Miller uh, opens, we see Miller opening the hatch to get inside of Eros, uh, which of course is completely effect infected by the protomolecule. As he enters the hatch, he sees the um, 
medical worker who had attempted to enter Eris from the previous episode who had died from a protomolecule infection. And um, Holden had to kill that ship of medical professionals who were only trying to help, however, uh, because they were risking f uh, spreading the protomolecule infection throughout the solar system, and he couldn't allow that. After Miller sees this dead body, he tells Holden that the, his friends were probably infected as well and that uh, he did the right thing. However, Holden then asks him, uh, how doesn't how does he know he's not just going to end up that same way as soon as he enters errors? Miller doesn't respond to this and instead just pries open the doors of errors and then to errors he says, "Remember me." Uh, meaning, I think again to me this is sort of further confirmation that Miller knows that he's going to sacrifice himself and that he is risking dying from the protomolecule uh, by going in there but he is willing to sacrifice himself to stop the protomolecule. This is something that he has already proved. Uh, and again, it's uh, the Rosnate crew are still under the uh, delusion that they'll be able to swoop in and save him but I think he knows better. So next we see Miller climbing a ladder while carrying his nuke behind him. And uh, as he's climbing, uh, the uh, nuke starts to go off, but the nuke is too far down and he can't reach the button to stop it from going off. Uh, and he, so he tries to pull it up uh, to him, but it's too heavy and he finds that he just doesn't have the strength to pull it up. So he realizes his only chance of hitting the button is to climb to a spot where he can jump off and then uh, have the nuke right next to him so he has to climb very fast and jumps and of course in the nick of time he manages to push the button and stop the nuke now granted this is kind of um you know a bit of a normal tv thing where they have to have a scene that is, has some tension and suspense to it and raises the stakes but i think the scene's also very effective and showing just what a precarious situation that Miller is in, that he's having to drag this big nuke wherever he goes, and for, so for having to do stuff like climb a ladder makes it impractical. In fact, he could have died right then and there just because he couldn't didn't have the strength to lift up the nuke. I, I actually think it was really interesting. So once Miller is there, we see him um, crashing his way into errors, and following Naomi's map, um, he sees a cart lying on the floor, so he decides to uh, fix it up and use that to carry the nuke in so he can drag the nuke uh, behind in the cart so he doesn't have to constantly carry it, which is uh, practical. We see he sees several dead bodies uh, lying around that are completely unaffected by the protomolecule. So he makes the observation that the protomolecule isn't interested in the dead, only the living. And this is something Naomi says she doesn't want to know what that's all about. But as he's going, he starts seeing the blue flickering uh, pieces of the protomolecule in the air and concludes that he's probably going the right way. He starts hearing voices as, at, as well. At first, he asks Naomi what she said, but she clarifies she didn't say anything. And then he's hearing more and more voices uh, that he points out, but Naomi says that uh, those voices aren't real. They're just an echo of who those people used to be. And Miller seems to be like, oh yeah, okay, but you get the impression that he doesn't completely buy it because we do know that Naomi is just guessing because nobody knows enough about the protomolecule to conclude exactly what those voices are. So back in the UN war room, we see uh, Sorrento Gillis and uh, Aaron Wright uh, ready their codes or their launch codes and the keys or whatever. And they give both give simultaneous authorizations uh, to launch the missiles. We then see the missiles launch out from Earth and we go to Tycho Station and we see uh, Fred Johnson and a drummer 
um, his right hand woman um, watch Earth as uh, the missiles launch from Earth and uh, Fred Johnson remarks something like so and so it goes and then we see Holden on the Rosinante also seeing the missile launch and um, he concludes he tells Amos that uh, they had to launch it was their only option now more interestingly enough, on Eros, we see Miller trying to put his cart back together, which fell apart. And all of a sudden, all of the blue firefly type things from the protomolecule, which were have been swimming around, and all the voices have been going off, all that stops all of a sudden. It just pauses and then speeds up very fast and the voices get very loud. So Miller then contacts Holden and asks uh, what is going on and Holden's like, well it's funny you should ask, uh, the UN just launched a bunch of missiles at Eros and Miller asks if he thinks that's a good idea and Holden kind of smartassly remarks that the UN didn't check with him first. <laughs> so they just tell him it means that they that he needs to pick up the pace however we go back to Tycho station with fred johnson and drummer and we see that errors just instantly disappears from their screens where they don't uh can no longer see it apparently it is no longer a uh, reflecting radar so they contact holden holden says they still have visual contact with errors they can see it right in front of them but they don't have radar contact it's no longer showing up on their screens it's uh not reflecting uh, radar so in addition to its magic abilities to suddenly accelerate like a spaceship, now it's able to go uh, dark, to go stealth, like a stealth ship. Uh, and the sort of scene we get with the blue flyer fireflies around Miller are suddenly reacting to the launch, makes it clear that uh, Eros is is directly responding to Earth um, launching missiles at it. And Alex kind of points out the obvious that if uh, Earth's missiles can't see errors, then it can't hit its target, meaning it can't destroy it. Which is a really, again, really ex exciting way to uh, raise the stakes. So next we go back to the war room uh, on Earth where uh, the UN has discovered that Eros has gone stealth, uh, which they're quite, of course, shocked at. But then they get a message from Fred Johnson who um, says that, yes, they probably noticed by now that Eros has gone stealth, but then informs them that he has a ship on errors that can see errors and that they could tar paint errors with the target lock in order to guide their missiles in but in order to do that uh, they would not be able to do that from earth because it is too remote and the delay time would do uh, be too long so in order to do that they would have to give guidance control to fred johnson so that he can guide the missiles in um and we can see some reactions in the room that are very dubious, uh, particularly Admiral Wynn, as soon as the message ends, Wynn goes on a rant about how this is what Fred Johnson has been waiting for, that he could just take those missiles and throw them at Earth or Mars. But then Avicerella points out that um, it was only the guidance controls, that they would still have control over the abort protocols so they could simply um, shut down the missiles if Fred Johnson tried to misuse them. Um, and we can see that Gillis is weighing his options and he's very unsure of what to do. Um, but Avicerella suggests that uh, she should talk directly to the captain of uh, the OPA ship that's orbiting Eros. So she asked to be put through the Fred Johnson, and next thing we see on the Rosinante, them getting a message from Avicerella uh, asking for um, the uh, to speak to the captain of the OPA ship, saying that they're in a desperate situation. So James Holden responds, and in the war room they see his message playing where Holden.
Holden says that uh, at this moment they, you know, they can only survive if they trust each other, and he prays that they will. Now, uh, immediately, Alvisarella takes this snide remark to um, Aaron Wright and says, well, it's a good thing the assassins missed, uh, referencing in season one where Aaron Wright sent assassins to kill James Holden against Alvisarella's suggestion. But Aaron Wright, of course, is kind of appalled in saying that we can't trust this man, and uh, so, uh, Wynn points out that he's uh, Fred Johnson's puppet. But... Um, Alvisarella points out that at any other time, just talking about this would get them all arrested for treason. However, in this situation, uh, Earth is at stake, and this is their only option, and that they, they should take it. And she specifically says that she vouches for James Holden. Now, Gillis is very, of course, just overwhelmed um, and, and makes some remark about what... Um, Something about a caterpillar and a butterfly. Uh, but basically, he's going to agree to this because he ultimately sees that this is their only option. So, Avasarella, of course, is willing to be trusting of James Holden because she had done research on him and talked to his mother and sort of got a feel for him and did think that uh, he was uh, decided that he was a good man even though Aaron Wright was convinced that he was an OPA terrorist she kind of knew better and she of course knows better now not to trust Aaron Wright's judgment which is why she was willing to stick her neck out for him and also um, this is like kind of the first meeting we get of Avasarela and Holden even though if it's just through recorded messages but when they do meet in person in the following season they have this experience to together to reference each other so they already have kind of a feel for each other um so yeah it's a uh, very good stuff as miller is traveling through eros he can hear uh voices continually uh and he tries to uh you know uh namely was speaking to him over the comms but then the comms go dead and he um tries to you know get it back but he's completely lost connection but he can keep following her map but as he's walking these voices get louder and he hears distinctly hears the voice of julie mal she's saying uh you can't take the razor back catch me if you can I'm gone and gone and gone. And Miller to himself kind of just is just like, you're not here. Because he recognizes the voice of Julie Mao. Now, he never met Julie Mao, but he, he again, he when he was searching for her, he studied her. He um, read all of her journals, her thoughts, so he feels like he has a really good understanding of what kind of person she is. And frankly, that he fell in love with her. Uh, as he was uh, following, trying to find her, and when he found her dead, that hit him extremely hard. And so to hear her voice kind of being parodied back to him right now is really hard uh, for him to hear. Um, and I gotta say, this scene gives me goosebumps <laughs> every time, just hearing her voice being like, uh, catch me if you can, like the playful way that she's saying that and just how like hard this hits Miller it's really really good stuff so next we get a couple of playful scenes to kind of lighten the mood in this very dark and serious episode which I think works a lot and is needed and it's not too playful as to be distracting uh first we hear um naomi talking to holden um as as uh, sorry to miller as she re-establishes connection amos is working to re-establish the connection and gets it going and naomi uh says miller and yells and he's like whoa whoa are you trying to blow my eardrum off uh and so they re managed to reestablish the connection and then miller ruminates that there was a time where he uh would root for eros over those missiles uh, meaning that he would want earth to be destroyed and naomi says uh, i know what you mean about the loda not get moving now this is a nice i didn't really catch this the first time i saw this episode but it was a really nice sort of connection of how you know the 
the belt has been mistreated from Earth, and sometimes they just hated Earth so much they would want Earth to be destroyed, even though it would mean their own destruction because they would run out of resources. And, um, and Naomi shares that connection because she also grew up in the belt and was also um, mistreated uh, by Earth. And so they, they share that in common. They're able to have to share that nice moment, which I think which I think is really nice. And the other moment we get that's kind of playful is on Errors, where Drummer is standing next to Fred Johnson and they see all the missiles that, and apparently they now have the codes. And uh, Drummer tells Johnson that he has, you know, control over all those missiles that makes him the most powerful man in the solar system. And Fred Johnson responds by saying, Oh, really? Well, go get me a coffee. And then Drummer just gives him a hand signal, which I am assuming is the belter signal for fuck you. <laughs> and the equivalent of a middle finger. In a very playful manner. And that was that was a really nice touch as well. A playful scene. And I think that it's, it's really these three episodes, because of these earlier episodes of season two is when they introduced the character of Drummer, who wasn't really... Um, a book character, I mean, kind of, sort of, like in book five in the future, but a totally different character who they just started rolling in all these different book characters into in the show, and that wasn't the plan from the beginning, it's just the actress and it was did such a good, great job, and the character really connected with audiences, and it seems like these that really helped, like, establish her as kind of the fan favorite that she would become. So on the Rosnate, Alex is reporting that Eros is accelerating uh, much faster than they are, and that they're losing Eros. In order to uh, keep up with Eros, they have to increase their acceleration, increase their speed. And doing so um, would be quite uh, hazardous to them. And uh, Holden uh, announced that uh, they need to stay with Eros in order to paint that target lock for the missiles. And um, Miller kind of notes that so the situation, so you're just going to, um, you know, the ship's just going to stay with Eros regardless if you survive. Um, just so the, it, the missiles can destroy it. And Holden's like, yes, that is the situation. So beat us to it. And that way we can um, all go home. And uh, Miller then suggests that uh, they bet a bottle of uh, Ganymede gin on who gets to destroy Eros first. Holden smiles and says, you're on. Uh, knowing that uh, the precarious the situation they're in is quite precarious and it's doubtful that any of them are actually going to survive. And so time... Uh, Alex announces that Eris is moving away, so he has to Holden has to make the decision now to either let it go or to follow it, which would mean they all have to strap in and have juice and prepare themselves from for some extreme acceleration. And uh, Holden looks to his crew. And uh, Amos nods in approval, saying that, yes, I'm willing to sacrifice myself uh, to keep up with errors. And uh, Naomi just eggs him on, wants him to make the call, and he makes the call to strap in and follow errors. And uh, you see Alex saying, yes, sir. Very Again, they're all supportive. It shows how supportive they are as a crew and how they're willing to sacrifice themselves for each other and they're willing to follow Holden uh, and the situation will most likely lead to their deaths. It's very powerful, very touching, and the chemistry is just explosive. So on Earth, we see that the um, war room meeting has disbanded, and as uh, Avastarella is walking out, uh, someone walks up to him and for her and informs her that uh, the Versanate is uh, keeping pace with Eros and is doing uh, 15 Gs. And Avastarella realizes that they're going to stay with Eros, even if it kills them all. And that you can see like a hint of respect. Uh, in her voice about this and I think her appreciation and respect for Holden it just went way up in this moment and he, she had already like respected him so then uh, we see Avisarella back in her office uh, and we see her um, 
I guess we could call assistant or, or uh, fix it man, uh, Cotier, uh, come up to her and inform her that all of the that they need to evacuate, that the Secretary General and all the other staff had already evacuated to Luna, and uh, she just tells him, give me one second. So then she calls her husband, Arjun, and he's on Luna at the moment, so there's a bit of a delay, like oh, only f by a few seconds, but there it makes talking a bit clumsy. I've actually done this before with internet connections that don't work very well. <laughs> and so they're like are talking over each other, and they have to pause, and eventually Arjun says, let me go first, and then he starts talking about how he had to put on a brave face when in all these different situations where she had put herself in danger, and she interrupts him to say, well, that's what I love about you, and he gets really upset and goes, god damn it, because he's kind of, she kind of <laughs> broke his train of thought, and, um, she apologizes and says, I'm sorry for putting you through all this. And he says, stop it. Just stop it. You never have to apologize um, for who you are. And he um, says that uh, how, how you know, lucky, you know, how great it is that he ended up with someone like her. And she just says, well, you got lucky, I guess. It's <laughs> sort of that nice little banter back and forth while they're both, like, teary-eyed. And um, she says that, yeah, he realizes that she's going to stay on Earth. And she says that her their home is in danger and that she needs to stay behind. Uh, and that was just such a, such a powerful conversation. It was just the whole, it was one, the way it was acted was absolutely beautiful. You can see the tears welling in their eyes. It's just be a beautiful moment. And then, uh, after the call, uh, she's really teary eyed and then Cotier comes back in the room, doesn't say a word. He looks at her and sees that she's really teared eyed. She tries to look away. Um, so he doesn't see it, but he sees it, and then without saying a word, he walks out of the room, because he knows that she's not going to leave. Like, he doesn't need, even need to ask her, he can see by the look in her eyes and her reaction that she's not going to leave, and he's not going to talk her into it, so he just leaves. It's, again, this, these subtle moments, and the, just how much information can be, um, given just by looks and no dialogues it's it's beautiful beautiful so on the rosnate we see that they are going uh they're buckled in they're they're uh accelerating very fast but alex is muttering to himself as as Air eros is starting to accelerate even faster so they have to speed up in order to keep up with them uh he mutters stuff like slow down god damn it but then he increases their speed and hits them with juice again and we see the crew react in pain to this as they are now being pinned to their chairs we see amos even says there goes my spleen um and that they're barely able to move um then on um Eros itself, we see Miller continuing to walk uh, towards the uh, the seed crystal, as Naomi calls it, and he sees more funky protomolecules, like the blue stuff increases, and it's looking increasingly weird, and he knows that he must be going the right way. In fact, he sees like uh, the protomolecule like materializing a blue hand. Um, like it's trying to create a human being. Um, and so as he's walking, he continues to hear Julie Mal, and he hears her a lot clearer and louder now talking about the Razorback and how she's gone and gone and gone. And, uh, Miller comes to sort of a realization. He, um, contacts Holden, who first asked Naomi to check his vitals to make sure he's not going crazy and she says her, her vitals his vitals are normal and then uh, he uh, proceeds to come up with a theory that um, perhaps Julie is still alive some part of her consciousness is uh, still with the protomolecule now Holden at first rejects this theory saying that Julie's dead they saw that she was dead 
and the, he kind of just thinks that Holden and that Miller's in denial. But uh, Miller says that while well, her body was dead, and he's not talking about her body; he's talking about some part of her, her consciousness, uh, and saying that the proto molecule infected her, but perhaps uh, that she infected the proto molecule right back, as he notes that um, she's keeps talking about the Razorback, and so he he uh, proposes that she thinks she's still on the Razorback, and that she's controlling the whole thing of Eros. And he notes that the seed crystal that Naomi's map is leading him to is in fact the Blue Falcon, which is the hotel in which Julie died in. So he said that Julie was the first one to get uh, infected by the protomolecule, and so perhaps uh, she's the one in charge. Holden, still skeptical, asks Miller if he's going to negotiate with a space station, and uh, Miller says, well, when you put it like that, it does sound a bit crazy, but he still insists that he has a strong inkling that, uh, that she is controlling errors and that he can talk her down however uh miller does uh the floor collapses beneath him and the nuke almost falls and he has to struggle to keep it up and it starts the alarm starts going off and it's too far down so he can't turn it off so he yells at holden to stop following them because he's sure that all this is happening because holden is still following them with the rosinate and uh, Holden refuses, says that he won't, and then so uh, Miller yells at him to tap the brakes, then. and so he agrees, he taps the brakes on the Rosinate, so it slows down, and we see uh, the crew noticeably ease in the pain that they were experiencing, uh, in fact, we see that uh, Naomi is bleeding through her nose, and uh, Amos is uh, sort of screeching in pain as they slow down, and the uh, weight of the acceleration acceleration isn't on them as hard anymore uh and then on uh Eris miller uh things calm down for him he's able to pull the bomb up uh from the hole and stop it and uh he insists to holden that he stop following them all together holden is still refusing and uh miller brings up the point that um there's no point that the Eros would be able to dodge the missiles in the same way they dodged the Navu. That the only chance of stopping it is for him to talk uh, to Julie. And so then his crew look to him and Holden makes the call to stop the Rosinate altogether and uh, Alex watches on the screen as it speeds away from them uh, meaning very soon it will be out of their sight and they will no longer be able to target lock it and uh, Holden then tells Miller that it's all up to him now So then we go uh, to Tycho Station where we see uh, Fred Johnson finding out about the fact uh, he gets the message from Holden that is that informs him that he's no longer uh, target uh, locking Eros and that he uh, suggests that Fred Johnson find a way uh, to divert the missiles and not uh, send them to Eros and that he's like there's no time I'm the one with boots on the ground this is what I suggest. Now, when Fred Johnson sees that message, he freaks out and is very upset and saying that uh, there's no way in hell he's going along with this because uh, the UN's going to think that the whole thing was a ploy, that it was just a trick to steal the missiles and that they're going to nuke Tycho Station and there's no way he's going to do this. But a Drummer has to knock some sense into him and says that it's already done. Eros is already already gone the Rosinante has already lost her and so Johnson simply comes to terms with this and says I hope you know what you're doing you little shit and again I like this kind of antagonistic uh, relationship that Johnson has with Holden uh, and they're not always playing by the same rules and Johnson has kind of a, a low opinion of Holden and it's probably part of the reason why he's not that ready to trust him but uh, in this case, he has no choice and he has to go along with this. So it was really great to see that that moment of weakness for him. 
So then we see uh, Miller arriving at uh, the Blue Falcon, and we see that it's completely run over with portal molecule. There's blue, uh, weird portal molecule things everywhere. There's the blue fireflies type things flying everywhere, swarming everything. And this is where it is most uh, active, and. Uh, Holden asks Miller how it looks, and he says it's, that it's kind of beautiful. And Holden tells him that uh, he it looks like he owes him that drink after all. And Miller responds by saying, you owe me a whole bottle, pal. But then Miller kind of pauses and, and says thank you to Holden for letting him into their little crew for just a little while. And Holden kind of jokes... Yeah, that didn't work out very well, how well that worked out. Um, and we see that Naomi is, sheds a single tear, and we see that Holden's like quite emotionally caught up in the moment as well. I think they all know that Miller is going to, about to die. <laughs> and they kind of all know, I mean, Holden says, oh, just go in there and stop Julie and we'll go and swoop you up. But I think... Again, they're really at this point that's just delusional, and I think they all know it. And this is why it's such an emotional time for them. And the whole and Miller's saying, um, you know, thanking them for letting the crew is obviously a goodbye, and it really sounds like a goodbye. And I think they all realize this on some level that uh, they're not going to see Miller again. And uh, Holden tries to say something to Miller, probably something affectionate and, and uh, with a lot of caring. However, Miller sees a lot of weird shit uh, where he's at, including a blue, those blue firefly protomolecule thingies make uh, form a bird. And it's the same kind of bird that he uh, saw or had uh, back on... Um, series station and so uh he realizes that's this way of the proto molecule talking directly to him like they know who he is and so miller turns off the comm before holden can finish his very thoughtful thought and uh, miller says to himself that it's time to see what's what so he follows the bird I'm a very, very, God, very, very, very powerful scene. So Miller follows the bird and leads him directly to Julie Mao. Now, uh, she's kind of floating in the, she's in a weird sort of alien environment and she's floating on this weird platform and I, it does seem like her body had been reconstructed by the proto molecule in the same way we saw the hand starting to be reconstructed and the, like the bird was reconstructed uh but it is julie and she's in this weird like sleep state and the miller says it's time for her to wake up uh she still doesn't but then his bomb starts beeping and he slaps it to turn it off. And the moment he does, her eyes pop open. Which I think this is like beautiful like timing, the way it's shot and edited. The how the sound of Miller turning off the bomb is like what triggers Julie's eyes to open. And she's very incoherent. So it's like the first time she's like coming to consciousness sort of um, since she died really uh i think uh because she at first asked miller where am i and uh says you know miller says she's on eros and kind of makes a joke about how the place has changed but it's actually quite an improvement over it. um and uh she's still sort of uh, confused and says that she dreamed that she was uh, flying, that she was racing and towards Earth. Uh, so I think it makes it clear that, um, yeah, that before this moment she was just in a subconscious state, that she wasn't like fully awake or aware until this very moment, until Miller showed up. Uh, which we can get in the whole discussion about how I think that's kind of intentional. There's this, uh, another thing that the writer, author of the novels and producer for the show mentioned, 
about the proto molecule because in early scenes of season later the season one and earlier episodes of season two we we saw that the right the moment right before julie mal died before the proto molecule took her over she saw a vision of miller and the bird now she never met miller she had no idea who he was uh it is true that at that time that she died, he was out looking for her. Um, but, and then Miller started having visions of Julie, like sort of talking to him and showing him the way. And um, the, yeah, so the producer um, and author Ty Frank kind of described that as the proto molecule being non linear, uh, that it's kind of exists outside of time. So for it, it's already become one with Julie and Miller because, well, that's what happens in this episode, uh, that they become one with the proto molecule and so that they're able to sort of reach backward in time because the, it doesn't really follow linear time and, and show them visions or images of, um, of each other because it knows that the two of them will be joined together uh, and so they're kind of linked in that way, which is why it recreated that bird and knew about the bird and, and Julie saw the bird. Uh, and, and, and so, it, yeah, and so they have this, this connection uh, that, they're, that they're not even aware of. So um, Miller uh, says, you know, oh, I haven't introduced myself. I'm, you know, Miller, I was sent by your father to... Uh, retrieve you and send you back to Earth, and she responds by calling it a kidnap job. Now, I think from what Miller just said, I was, you know, um, hired to bring you back to Earth. I mean, I suppose one would infer that that is a kidnap job, but the, from the way, what little information he gave and the way he said it, I have a feeling that she was aware of a kidnap job because of the hair connection uh, with Miller through the proto molecule, especially in this weird proto molecule state that she's in, uh, because a kidnap job is exactly what Miller was calling it. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like even though she could probably come up with the same term, I feel like this kind of implies uh, their connection as well. So Julie, in her very disoriented state, uh, tells Miller that uh, they left her. They like they left me all alone. They abandoned me, and this is referring to the last thought she had before she died, because she tried to call out to Dolls for help, and he didn't respond to any of her messages, and so she felt abandoned and alone. And Miller. Uh, just changes tanks by telling her that they're headed to Earth and that they can't go there right now. Uh, this is when she says that she dreamed that she was racing uh, and he tells her that um, that the, she needs to stop that. That uh, they can't return to Earth uh, because uh, if she goes there a lot of good people will die and it's the same people she's been fighting for. Uh, and she says that she, she uh, says that she can't do it. That she she's not strong enough to stop. And, and uh, whole, uh, Miller says that you have to try. And then she says, "No, we can't stop it. We can't stop the work." And when she says that, there's like a huge uh, reverberation on her voice, like it's a monster speaking. It's like the proto molecules getting angry and miller of course consents this and realizes that this isn't the right tact that this is not going to she he's not going to be able to stop it that way that is hell bent on going there so he tries a different tact so he, he backs up and he says and you can tell the way he looks around he's really nervous about how he just pissed the proto molecule off uh which is a nice touch um and he changes tact and he says okay fine we don't have to go to Earth, but how about Venus? We can go to Venus, uh, and the, we're going that way anyway, and the work can, can continue there. All good. Um, 
Which is, yeah, it was a <laughs> pretty good uh, thinking on his feet. In the um, novels, it was actually Holden who suggested that to Miller that he suggest Venus. I kind of like this better, that, that Miller himself thought of it on the fly. <laughs> just on a second, just smart enough to sort of change tax and be like, no, nah, how, how about we go to Venus instead? Uh, and and she still says that she doesn't think she's strong enough that that she can't she's not sure she can stop it and then the bomb starts beeping again like it's gonna go off and Miller goes to it but he hesitates and he just sits there with his hand near the button and he looks at her and then this is such a powerful moment and the music like really swells at this moment too because you you can every, god it's so powerful because it really relates that he is really really contemplating just blowing up blowing her up right then and there just letting the bomb go off because it kind of looks like she she's not going to be able to control Eros. It looks like that she's not going to be able to stop it. She Every time he suggests that she uh, change course or not go there, she's very resistant. And she doesn't have faith that she's going to be able to stop Eros. So he's kind of, his faith in her is, is wavering a bit. And he doesn't, um, and so he contemplates just letting the nuke go off and hoping that will will stop errors but again he's not entirely sure that would work anyway but he does ultimately press the button he does ultimately push it and then he comes back with like a more renewed faith and more renewed faith in julie uh i think at this moment he decided that that he should trust Julie, that he knows her better from all of her, his studying of her and, and just how strong-willed she is. He, he just completely lends himself over into his faith and confident that she will be able to stop errors and just forgets about the bomb. So he comes back to her with renewed faith and tells her that... Uh, he made that she made him believe become a believer and that was an amazing thing to do for a guy like him to turn him into believe to into a believer because of her strength and then he says with conviction that i know you're a fighter i know and uh she responds by saying i'm done fighting i just want to go home and then he says to her, like, very sort of lovingly and caringly, he says, you can't go home, Julie. You can go anywhere in the universe, but not there. Um, and then he tells her, he asked her to hold something for him because the bomb starts beeping again. And um, so she puts her hand on the bomb and uh, she asks, what is it? And he says, don't worry, it can't hurt you. And we see that it kind of deactivates when she touches it. And it's particularly when she takes her hand away from the bomb, it's like we hear it powering down. So her weird protomolecule powers or whatever diffuse the bomb because he's not worried about the bomb. He doesn't want the bomb there anymore. He is. I think he, it was his intention to turn it off because he didn't think it was necessary because he knows that julie is going to be able to uh, turn the the errors around to venus um and then he um takes his helmet off and which makes him extremely vulnerable to the protomolecule in fact he sort of breathes it in and he takes her hand and Julie asks what's going to happen to them. And he says uh, he doesn't know. That they'll die maybe. But whatever happens is going to happen to the both of them. And then uh, she tells him that you belong with me. And then they embrace and they kiss. And then they sort of hug each other to the end. Which, I gotta say, the music in the scene is absolutely beautiful. And as I said, this, this scene brings me to tears every single time I watch it. Now, 
again, I watched a podcast with, with Ty Frank, and he had said that um, he disagreed with the creative choice to have Miller and uh, Julie kiss. Uh, that didn't happen in the novels. It was a choice from the director, and he uh, kind of fought it, but was overruled by the director and the showrunner, uh, who thought it was that it should happen. And um, Wes Chatham, who plays Amos, who was also on that same podcast, said that he also agreed with the director, <laughs> that he, he believed that he liked the kiss, and he thinks that it should have stayed in. And you know what? I agree with them as well. I also really like the kiss, and I do think it was a good choice. Um, now, Ty's reasoning for that is that, that uh, Miller and Julie were not really in love because they didn't really they didn't know each other like julie never met miller before and miller never met julie he just like read about her and studied her which isn't the same as knowing someone but my counter to that would be that it's not really about like an enduring love romance or whatever of people getting married and and love enduring and then like having a marriage and putting up with each other for 30 40 years and, and because yes i agree if they were not about to die um and they uh, met each other and they got married and had a long relationship it would probably fall apart in a year or two <laughs> at best because you're right he's right they don't know each other um they don't really know each other but that's not really what's in uh required for this kiss like every couple that kiss or any kiss that's romantic doesn't need to be of a place of say you know a lasting enduring love of people who are going to get married and raise children together that could be just the uh fleeting romance or uh the heat of the moment romance of two lovers meeting for one night and never seeing each other again um uh, which and that still can be romantic in its own way. But this is romantic in a way that they're about to die together. <laughs> so they're not going to be together very long. But in some ways they're going to be together forever because they both are sort of become intertwined with the proto-molecule. Uh, which is why uh, she asks what's going to happen to him. He's like, I don't know we die maybe but if we don't that'd be interesting too um but it's clear that whatever is going to happen and this is what he says to her whatever is going to happen he's going to face it with her and plus there's the whole thing about the non-linear thing that even though they never actually met they have this connection through the protomolecule because they both become one of the protomolecule that connection reaches backward in time uh, to um, particularly this moment so even though they don't they never actually met each other this they had already lived, spent an eternity to get together through the protomolecule at least that's that's a possibility so so with Julie saying you belong with me that seemed um genuine that seemed because it has the, the non-linear thing she knows her destiny she knows his destiny and it feels right everything feels right in the moment and this feels like a deep love in this moment which it probably is even though as i said if they don't know each other if they got married they, the marriage will fall apart in a year or at most uh, but that is irrelevant uh for this romance working for the type of romance that it is um so i think it's extremely powerful in fact one of the most powerful love scenes in all the fiction i will i will call that out right now uh, uh because it's powerful in a unique way uh in a way that he did fall in love with her because he did admire and adore her and it's his faith in her that gets her to to find the strength in order to save all of humanity and then they they die together like 
how more romantic can you get than that? I, I think that's like the pinnacle of romance <laughs> and, and storytelling, personally. We then get one last montage played over music with no dialogue where we see the various different reactions to people watching Eros head towards Venus. Um, we see Ava Sorala sitting on the roof of her uh, house looking up at the sky. We see uh, Diago, uh, the boy whose life Miller saved, getting a new tattoo while he's watching the news feeds about Eros. Um, going to Venus, and we see Fred Johnson, and uh, Drummer actually brings him that coffee, <laughs> after all, and has uh, he points to the to the screen, and they watch Eros uh, go towards Venus, and of course the most touching part of the montage is we see the Rosinate crew in the mess drinking a bottle of uh, Ganymede gin, just like Miller had suggested, and they're doing a toast, obviously, to Miller. Uh, and then they even, like, raise their glasses towards the empty seat that Miller used to sit in. As if they're toasting him or toasting his ghost. Um, uh, <laughs> it's just, sorry. It is just breaking into tears right now. It is just so powerful. It's, it's just, and, and how grateful they are to him for saving all of humanity um and then we see eros actually collide with venus and the episode ends so yeah um i think this is about as close this is close to a perfect episode that you're that you could possibly get i think this is the episode of television that is most worthy of being called a perfect episode um and I said before, I think it is the best episode of all television. Now, am I 100% certain on that? Is it kind of tied with two other episodes? Yeah, it kind of is. But uh, it doesn't really matter. I think this is what cemented The Expanse as a masterpiece to me. Um, now, granted, they don't have another episode that, to me, is quite as good as this one. But they still have a lot of great, well-written material character development it's not like this is the peak of the show and it's all downhill from here not at all uh, um it's it's more in fact it's more like the opposite it's more like this is when the show really hit its stride even though it never got as good as this episode that's an impossible bar to meet um but it maintained this high quality and and continued to get just pump out much better things and this episode itself as i said i think is one of the most romantic stories it's very suspenseful and intense having earth in danger and i think having the dynamic of seeing avasrella in the war room actually it does improve a lot from the books because you get the sense of the people on earth and how desperate they are and at the same time you get holden and his crew and how desperate they are that they're willing to sacrifice themselves but ultimately they have that trust in Miller and Miller has that trust in Julie um, and it's just it's the perfect episode <laughs> what else can I say so that's it that is finally it I'm finally finished with my perfect episode series which I've been doing for about over a year now I believe uh, the 10 entries you can check out on my channel are all be in the playlist there should be a link to that playlist in the description of this video uh, so thank you so much uh, for watching uh, this a perfect episode series for and the main thing I wanted to do with this a perfect episode series was to touch on episodes that I felt weren't appreciated enough and didn't get as much love as they should now this episode does get quite a bit of love from expanse fans like as i said west chatham who plays amos called this his favorite episode of the show and i'm sure there's many attached to the show who would share that same sentiment and it is one of the highest rated episodes online of the expanse throughout the fan but outside of the expanse it's not well known because the well the expanse itself is an underrated show so i definitely felt the need to highlight that here 
So anyway, that is it. That is my entire series of a perfect episode going through ten, ten episodes that I felt were near perfect. That sh- that I wanted to analyze. That I felt needed more attention. Uh, and so you can check out any of those videos, as I said in the playlist. And uh, thank you so much for joining me for this series. Uh, if you did enjoy this, please check out my channel for much more expanse content and much more videos and many other shows uh, such as uh, Star Trek, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, uh, Lord Dex, uh, House of the Dragon, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.